Then I would like to talk about a couple of restorations uh, projects that are going on in shingle pits um, around Selwyn District. There's about, uh, there's about 200 shingle pits that are around um, Selwyn District, and so there's huge potential to do to do this and create corridors um, throughout our landscape. Uh, and also I'd like, like to acknowledge John, my co-author, he certainly set this uh, talk up, uh, giving us an introduction to Nine Naturalists, which, which I will um, uh, also go into a little. Okay, so I just want to acknowledge a few people at the start, uh, Jim Hutton um, and also Michelle Frey, who are instrumental in the, uh, the Prebleton uh, Nature Park, and I did had long discussions with them about their problems and, and things that went well. Sue Jarvis, um, Ralph and, and <coughs> Sue Allen, also um, from the Mahoe Trust, who um, do a, a lot of work there. Salmon District Council for funding, they help, they fund both those uh, two restoration projects. And many volunteers, I'm not going to go right through the list, it'll be too long, and there's many more there to go. So just to put the perspective, for those who don't know where uh, Prebleton and uh, Mahoe Reserve are, so um, Prebleton is, is sort of peri-urban, just out of, out of Christchurch, and the, the nature park is right in, spanked in the middle really, and same with uh, Mahoe. Since the subdivisions have happened, Mahoe is basically um, surrounded now. <coughs> just a few um, facts and figures, um, Mahoe is very small, um, whereas in comparison, Prebleton Nature Park is, is a wee bit bigger. Both the plantings <coughs> happened about the same time. Um, uh, Prebleton site has got a few more species. And um, the plant sources are uh, sort of different, different areas. We tried to keep um, eco sources as much as possible at Mahoe. And the different um, management sort of practices at Prebleton, they tended to use a lot more mulch and bark, whereas we seem to have used combi-guard type, type management. So here's Mahoe about four years ago. This is a, a drone uh, footage. You can see um, uh, here's the road here, Boundary Road. The school's just across the road, so this is the high school. Just down below that is the, pre uh, is the um, primary school, and then we have kids first, just along from them. So we've got lots of potential for education. <coughs> um, on this picture, you'll, you'll note there's brown areas, uh, a eucalypts that got chopped down just before this photograph. Um, we shall continue on. And here is the Prebleton site. Um, uh, you can see there's a lot more grass area that hasn't been planted, so it's thinner, more edge effect. Um, the houses now go right round, even down this side, they're starting to develop that area there. Lots of tracks. This area here does, does become a wash in the, in the winter, so we get wetland birds going into there. Okay, so this was the, this is the Mahoe Reserve when it was called the Pit. And, um, it really was dominated by exotic species, eucalypts, um, exotic grass, um, gorse, and um, broom. So uh, I, I don't think I tried to look, I couldn't see a single native species there, and I can't recall right from the beginning if it was. It probably was. And this is a, 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 a year after that, when the first planting happened. And Sue Jarvis was instrumental in this, the teacher at, uh, then, at the high school, we got the, the kids out there and started uh, planting. And the planting continues, and, and every year we plant about three or four hundred plants. And um, here's me giving a demonstration. We tried to get those plants in the ground properly, and um, uh, it seems to work well. So here's some, some of the people that helped us. We get um, people from um, the Florida University coming over and helping us. Um, and this is a sort of a post planting photograph. Some of the issues that we have, and today you're going to hear about a few of the issues, but some of the good things as well, is um, after, the, after the earthquake, we actually sort of had different dynamics here, and we planted these things, and we got flooded, and we lost quite a few plants. And now we've had to put a walkway down through here and um, to allow access through, um, and we've changed our planting regime just a little bit. So flooding is, is a bit of a problem in the winter, and in the summer it gets very dry. Remember, it's a shingle pit. It's very stony, it's, it's, it's low-lying, 
So when the water level comes up, you get it in the winter. Uh, when it dries out in the summer, it gets very dry. So quite hard conditions to, to restore plants. <coughs> I want to talk a little bit about um, uh, education, and, and given that the, uh, we've got all of these uh, all of these different groups, apart from the Florida University, right next door, we actually do a lot of education. And here's some kids from the high school. Um, they've got a pooter, and they're, they're, they're sucking out the contents of this wetter motel, uh, and having, having great fun in the process. And uh, what we have found in these wetter motels uh, um, cave wetter, um, earwigs, um, spiders, and, and the likes. So a great tool for kids to, to, to learn about biodiversity on their doorstep. And another method, um, using wooden discs, this is one I've been going on about um, since this publication. It's great, you can do this in your backyard or you can do it in a reserve like this. You just have to lift up the, up the disc and, and have a look and see what's underneath. And hopefully here I've got a video that will show you what you can achieve underneath some of these wooden discs. This one's actually from Puna Kaiki, the restoration site over there. So you can see lots of um, centipedes, ground beetles, you get um, uh, earthworms, they're a nick, it's earthworm, and also cave wetter. So really cool cool way to monitor what's what's out there and the kids love it <coughs> and the types of things that we found at Mahoe uh, are those that we just showed but also we, we get the vagrant spider a really large spider which you know the kids either love or hate uh, and and also big drivers Antarcticus um, here with um, some eggs which they protect even when they go to to um, young so one of the projects that the high school got involved in was actually um, doing some tracking tunnels and they got really excited when they put these out and they actually got some skink tracks on there but on another tracking tunnel they actually got some hedgehog tracks and they decided they wanted to do something about this this is a really cool story we want to protect these mice uh, sorry to protect these uh, skinks and um, they, they, they designed this area that's going to be slightly raised, they're going to put um, lizard uh, uh, berries in there, or plants that grow berries for lizards, we've got some uh, logs in there, and we've got some angeline for the lizards. And the, hopefully this, um, this netting will keep out those hedgehogs which gobble them up, they just vacuum them up as we found on Kyle Island. So a cool little story that those schools got involved in. Now John's basically set me up perfectly for this. Another project that we do on, and, uh, and we use iNaturalist for um, is, a, is a 202 uh, biodiversity coast to coast, uh, quite different to the other coast to coast. But we travel um, from Lincoln um, throughout the, through the, the middle of the South Island, drop, stopping off at different <coughs> places and assessing the biodiversity there, all the way over to Punakaiki. And what we do is we put a 10 by 10 uh, transect out and we measure the invertebrates, the, the uh, plants, the fungi and, and, and so forth. And we do a, a five minute bird count as well from those sites. And so the, the students can actually learn about the different habitats along the way and how the, the fauna and flora are quite different. So starting at somewhere like um, Lincoln, you, obviously you'd think that the, uh, the, the, the flora and fauna would be a little bit boring probably be right. And so here's some of the, um, some of the uh, insects and um, lizards um, that we found, and so earthworms and so forth, um, that we found just at Mahoe, and these were extracted off uh, that coast to coast um, um, website that, that, that we used on an iNaturalist. So we also um, record birds and so forth, and um, uh, the two most common birds in both locations are uh, the uh, silver eye by far and then the, the fantail. However, we did have a surprise appearance back in uh, 2015 where uh, we actually got a tui landed in, in uh, Mahoe and we were quite excited. We were just about to do a planting and two of us looked around and thought, well, that seems like a tui. And uh, sure enough, the tui landed there and it stayed there for two or three days. and 
and Laura and John came came over and visited, took photographs and, and recorded it. And I, I believe you've decided that it came from North Canterbury. Is that was the dialect? Is that correct or is it? Uh, okay. It didn't didn't come from Banks Peninsula, Wagaroa. So yeah, interesting, and it, and it was pretty cool for us. Another thing that we do um, also is, um, or we have done, is back in 2015, we actually put out light traps. We did this on the same night at both these reserves, uh, just to see what biodiversity we get in the moth fauna. And, and uh, this is what we got. So 33 and 31 species of moth from these two, uh, two reserves. And 70 to 74% of them were native. So it'd be interesting to know if we actually got more diversity of plants in there, can we actually increase the diversity of, of moths and maybe reduce uh, the, the species, the exotic species that are feeding on the grass species, <coughs> exotic grass species. <coughs> Everything is not perfect in this world, unfortunately. I just want to talk about some negative aspects that happen in, in restoration. Some, I'm sorry to lower the tone here a little bit, but I think we've got to be realistic, and this is what happens sometimes um, in restoration sites, particularly when they're in and around populations. And we've had a lot of damage there. Um, we've had a um, little fence for our lizards has got damaged. We've had lots of these uh, signposts. We spent a lot of money on these these um, these boards have got wrecked, and also plantings, and it's very frustrating for us particularly when we spend a lot of time as volunteers um, in these areas. We've also had a fire bug there. We had to get the police involved with a little, little camera to, to track down who was the culprit. And on one occasion, it looked like they were trying to cook up a feed because the potatoes and apples in there as well. <laughs> so we do use um, some species to try and deter um, the... the um, the culprits from going into areas, and they're onga onga and um, bush lawyer, and they have worked to a degree in some of the areas, particularly when the plants get big enough. But when they're not big enough, they just get trampled, trampled down like this, which yeah. has been quite, quite frustrating. Um, so thanks, Steve Bush, for providing some some plants. Some of them didn't didn't cope too well, but other ones have. We've got some uh, nasty weeds in there, and. Um, Obviously at the start we had broom and gorse um, that were dominating that landscape. Uh, those now are getting on top of, we're still getting them popping up as that seed source is slowly wearing off in the ground. Convolvulus is something that's become uh, quite, quite a pain, um, particularly growing up the trees and smothering small ones. Twitch is really difficult to grow amongst um, particularly the smaller plants, but this Madeira vine is a shocking thing here and all these pictures are, are that, that beast. Um, it's only on, on iNaturalist, there's only three places in Canterbury where it exists and we're one of them, unfortunately. We've had um, <coughs> green waste uh, th thrown over from neighbours, so uh, things like mint have taken hold in some areas where that's been thrown over. I've been stabbed by weeding around the area when I've got some rose prunings in my hand. I should have been, should have been wearing gloves, I know. Uh, lawn clippings and, and soil has been dumped <coughs> over the edge and smothered some of the smaller plants. And then we've had some freedom planters who put in some interesting, colourful sort of pittosporum hybrids and even agapanthus, yeah. I ask. We managed to convince them to put natives in there. That council actually gave them some, which was good. So, all in all, things have really gone well, and here you can see um, what we started off with. And I got up early on a frosty morning just th this week and um, took that photograph. So, we feel as if we're making a lot of progress, and that's really cool. So, I just wanted to just, just go through my final slide. Um, some of the lessons that we've learned, some of this are, is, obvious, is very obvious to, to many of you practitioners. Um, people are both your best asset but also can be very problematic depending who they are. And usually those problem ones are a very sort of uh, small number. It's important when you've got a group of people um, who, are, who are restoring an area to actually have the same <coughs> idea of what a restored area is going to look like. And we've had a few issues in, in that respect. Getting baseline um, data for, for fauna is, is obviously important. Um, 
sometimes you kind of forget to do that because you're so excited about putting those plants in the ground. But if you can do that really early on or even before you're planting, um, that's cool. And then same again for those photo points. Try and choose a place that's not going to get overgrown in front of where you start, start doing that. It's, it's fairly obvious, but sometimes you don't realise how, how, how high these are going to grow. And, and establishing a really good rapport with um, neighbours is really important. It's quite hard to do something once something happens that's um, a wee bit antagonistic. So try and do it early on in the piece. Keeping good records about, about um, species that you're, you're putting in the ground, how many, I think at Mahoe we've done that pretty well. The Prippleton uh, Nature Park, it's probably not quite as good <coughs> as our records, but um, really, really important. Tell the community what you're doing, and that's something that we do. We let them know we really have, a, have a working bee down, down at Mahoe. This, they do the same also at Prippleton. And um, then, we, then we put a photograph in after the event and show them what, we, what we were up to and who was there. And then try and engender a, a sense of ownership with those, with those schools because um, when you get problems with those schools, as we've found, um, it can be uh, quite a pain. But we were actually doing some good stuff in the educational um, framework, so that's, that's great. And then finally, um, make sure that volunteers know what, what is most essential to do. Um, we sometimes get them going on and, and sort of weeding around these great big tall trees when we've got these small seedlings that are completely smothered by grasses. So it's important to have someone there telling them what to do and what the priorities are. Thank you very much. <coughs>